President, permission of General Michel. On behalf of Dr. Stephen Sweeney, our President, I welcome you to the College of New Rochelle and tonight's presentation celebrating the 475th anniversary of our Foundresses, the Air Salons. This presentation has been supported as well by the Sister Alice Gallon Lecture Fund created to honor our scholar in residence, Sister Alice Gallon and Ursuline, on the occasion of her 60th anniversary. Tonight, we especially celebrate the Ursulines, our foundresses, and their many contributions to society, the church, and to Catholic higher education in America. Our speaker, Dr. Scott Appleby, is professor of history and the John M. Reagan, Jr. Director of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame, an historian who earned his doctorate from the University of Chicago. Dr. Appleby studies modern religions and their capacity for both violence and peace building. He is the author or editor of several books, including Strong Religion, The Ambivalence of the Sacred, Religion, Violence, and Reconciliation. Spokesman for the Despised, Fundamentalist Leaders of the Middle East. And Be Right, Conservative Catholics in America. From 1988 to 1993, Dr. Appleby was co-director of an interdisciplinary study of global religious resurgence. It culminated in the publication of the five-volume Fundamentalism Project, which he edited with Martin E. Murray. He co-chaired the Chicago Council on Global Affairs Task Force on Religion in U.S. Foreign Policy which this year produced the report, Engaging Religious Communities Abroad, a new imperative for U.S. foreign policy. A fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, he is the recipient of three honorary doctorates. Let us welcome Dr. Scott. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. I want to um, thank particularly Dr. Joan Bailey for arranging my visit here in this talk, and uh, President Sweeney, President-elect Huntington, and of course I'm particularly honored to be speaking in a lecture series that's uh, established in honor of Sister Alice Gallant, mm -hmm. who is really, as I think you know and you certainly should know, really one of the great giants in the study of Catholic higher education in the United States. The way I think of Sister Alice is as uh, part of a duo, the other member of which is uh, Phil Gleason, Dr. Philip Gleason, my colleague at the University of Notre Dame. Together these two uh, really outstanding scholars and leaders really pioneered uh, not only the study of Catholic higher ed, but also uh, exercised leadership in helping bishops and presidents and others uh, understand both the great benefits of Catholic higher ed, its challenges, and how to move forward. So I'm delighted to be uh, here with Sister Alice for this. Is that echo still there? Uh, I come from the University of Notre Dame, or the University of Notre Dame, and I hear that you are Ursulines and Ursulines. I've been listening, and uh, so I'm going to pronounce it both ways. <laughs> like I do with Notre Dame, Notre Dame. The long title which you were spared in the brochure of my presentation is The Charitable Objects of Your Institution, which is a quote from Thomas Jefferson, How the Ursulines Overcame Nativism, Feminized Higher Education, and Helped Catholics Become Americans. On February the 23rd, 1727, a small band of 11 Ursuline nuns under contract by the Company of the Indies and led by Mother Marie Tranchepan, sailed from France bound for Louisiana. After encountering storms, pirates, and sandbars, they arrived in New Orleans five months later in August to open the first convent of religious women in what was later to become the United States. They had been promised support 
and a building for the convent, neither materialized. But the sisters persevered in creating the first permanent establishment of women religious in the country, and in building a tradition of teaching young women and caring for the needy and the dispossessed, especially for orphans. Among the first fruits of the Catholic Reformation of the 16th century, the Company of St. Ursula was founded in 1535 in Brescia, Italy, by, Aunt, by Angela Merici. Having grown up amid foreign armies and civil strife in northern Italy, Angela turned to the Golden Legend and its account of the heroic women of the early church. At an early age, she made the decision to model her own life on the example of the active concern for the poor and the modeled by those early church women. Upon receiving a vision of a heavenly ladder with maidens ascending and descending it, and hearing a voice telling her they were members of an order she was to found, Angela bowed herself to virginity and took the habit of a Franciscan tertiary. She then set about organizing the plentiful supply of young widows in the town to do relief work with the poor. She was concerned particularly for women driven by poverty to prostitution and disease. And she began working among the company of divine love in a hospital for the incurable, those affected by venereal disease, what today we call STD. In 1525, St. Angela successfully applied to Rome for permission to establish a company of virgins devoted to teaching the young and caring for the sick. Angela's approach was to combine, to combine practical assistance and service with religious instruction in order to save women from immorality and destitution. The rule of the Company of St. Ursula, finally approved in 1534, divided the sisters into two tiers, each with its own superior. Virgins, usually from the lower classes at one tier, and matron widows, usually from the upper class. Angela was mistress general, and initially the Ursulines were under direct papal jurisdiction. As superior, Angela provided for corporate ownership of property, thereby enabling the company of sisters to run orphanages and schools for abandoned girls and recovered prostitutes. A list of members compiled in 1537 indicates, quote, the majority were girls of humble background who remained uncloistered and did not suffer civil death, which accompanied religious vows, the loss of any civil rights or status. When Angela died in 1540, one of every four families in Brescia housed an Ursuline. The historian Joanne McNamara in, her, McNamara, in her detailed overview of Catholic nuns, emphasizes how creative and original was Angela's approach, taking advantage, as it did, of a relatively brief window of opportunity following the crisis of the Protestant Reformation and its attendant dislocations. To, a, to a, in order to develop during that destabilization, when there was an opening for women, she developed a model of feminine piety and apostolic life that was attuned to the needs of the Renaissance, the early modern period, including the need for greater social mobility and relative autonomy from, the, from dioceses, bishops, and cloisters, institutional realities that soon began to try to reassert their control over the lives of women living a religious life. That word autonomy is very important for the Ursulines. Earlier today when I was asking people, well, what is it about the Ursulines? What's distinctive? The word autonomy came up. It was not always said in a flattering way, I must say. <laughs> six different Ursulines, six different points of view, six different ways forward. But it served the company very well in its early years and throughout its history. St. Angela Council, moving confidently ahead in faith, notes James T. Schleifer, the historian of this college. Act, bestir yourselves, you will certainly see wonders, she told her company of St. Ursula. If, with change of time and circumstances, it becomes necessary to make fresh rules or to alter anything, then do it with prudence after taking good advice. The word advice there is an important choice of words, I think. The Ursulines were innovative, yes, but not dramatically different 
from other reforming orders, nor were they off the map in their resistance to what they saw at times as the encroachments of bishops, male religious, princes, and other officials of the political and ecclesial establishment of their day. In highlighting the sisters' struggle to wrest themselves free from the reigning class of male elites, it might be going too far to suggest a direct link between the Latin root of Ursula, which means little female bear, <laughs> and today's mama grizzlies. <laughs> but the Ursulines did exhibit a spirit of creativity and independence, adaptation and innovation, especially pertaining to configuration of gender roles and religious authority. And in this respect, as in many others, the Ursulines were both trailblazers, trailblazers and exemplars for the numerous communities of religious women that flourished from the 16th to the 20th centuries in Europe and North America. After Angela's death in 1540, powerful currents in the Counter-Reformation closed that window of opportunity I was referring to, and forced the Ursulines into the cloister, and by the 17th century had restricted the community's work to one area of service, namely the education of young women. But the legacy of resolute action, confident innovation, service to the world, and faithful adaptation to new circumstances survived. The Ursuline sisters who arrived in New Orleans in 1727 witnessed the colony change hands several times, and in 1803 they found themselves citizens of the new United States, a new Protestant nation, with the president, Thomas Jefferson, not known for his love of supernatural religion, and not by any reckoning fond of Roman Catholics. Anxious about their new legal status as citizens of the United States, and worried that they might not retain their property rights, the Ursulines petitioned both Bishop John Carroll and Jefferson himself, foreshadowing a pattern that would develop in the 19th and 20th centuries, the overcoming nativism part of my presentation, as deist, Protestant, and nativist disdain of papism gradually gave way to widespread recognition of the unmistakable essential contributions of Catholics and other religious orders to the public good in America, Jefferson responded, the principles of the Constitution and government of the United States are a sure guarantee to you that your property rights, dear sisters, will be preserved to you sacred and inviolate, and that your institution will be permitted to govern itself according to its own voluntary <coughs> rules without interference from the civil authority. Whatever diversity of shade may appear in the religious opinions of our fellow citizens, a polite way of saying despite the religious bigotry of many Americans, <laughs> the charitable objects of your institution cannot be indifferent to any, and its furtherance of the wholesome purposes of society by training up its younger members in the way they should go cannot fail to ensure the patronage of the government. Be assured that it will meet with all the protection which my office can give it. I salute you, Holy Sisters, with friendship and respect. The, the point here, the pattern here, is that nativism, that is uh, the tendency historically in the United States in the 18th, especially in the 19th, and well into the 20th century for native-born, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, but a larger company of Protestant Americans, the tendency among some of those to uh, view Catholics with dread, fear, hostility, and suspicion was, was an abiding strain, as you know, in American history. And the most effective way and enduring way that that strain was overcome was by the manifest good works and citizenship of not only the Ursulines, but of many women religious, uh, because they provided the safety net, we call it today, the social infrastructure for a government that could not always meet the needs of wave after wave of immigrants, mostly Catholic, but not always Catholic. And eventually, of course, the sisters, and not only the sisters alone, but male religious orders as well, focused not only on Catholics, but on all who were needy and needed education. So the theme here is that by their actions, by their fruits, they came to be known. It took a long time, and it was uh, kind of 
an up and down process in terms of two steps forward and one step back in terms of gaining recognition, but um, it, it's an important legacy of the Ursulines as leaders of the larger company of religious. Jefferson's equanimity, that is, toward the Ursulines was not shared, for example, by the Bostonians who on August 11th and August 12th, 1834, stirred by anti-Catholic propaganda, rioted, ransacked, and burned the Ursuline convent in Charlestown, Massachusetts, one of the most notorious episodes in American history, certainly of nativism, still is in all the history books taught to, to school children in this country. Ironically, given the sisters' origins and missions, the Protestant mob perceived them as elitists and as a threat to social mores. In 1820, the new French bishop of the newly created diocese of Boston had granted permission for the establishment of a convent of Ursuline teaching nuns in a building next to the cathedral. A school for girls was set up in the convent in which approximately 100 students were enrolled. By 1827, the school and convent had outgrown the building. In July of that year, the community moved to a larger building in Charlestown. The school began to enroll primarily the daughters of Protestant upper classes of Boston, not educating primarily Catholic young women at that time, but Protestant upper classes. By 1834, there were 47 students, only six of whom were Catholic. According to Jenny Franchot, the author of A History of Antebellum, Anti-Catholicism, the presence of a community of Catholic women religious in their midst reminded Protestant Bostonians of the increasing influx of Irish Catholics who were taking over the labor market. The existence of the Ursuline Convent thus emphasized both the economic discomfort felt by non-Catholics in general and the religious discomfort felt by conservative Protestants, such as the Reverend Lyman Beecher, whose intemperate sermons incited the crowds. And um, the, the fear was that in educating elite uh, Protestant women of the upper classes, those women would be converted to Catholicism by the sisters, or at the very least would take on ideas and practices and principles that were not seen as either Protestant or American. So there was a sense in which you're trying to create inroads, you Ursulines, into our very stronghold of strength culturally. Thus were the Ursulines implicated in a second pattern of Americanism, contrary to the one signaled by Jefferson, in which Catholics were perceived not as the carrier of American values, but as their usurpers. So I'm going to say more about Americanism and how Catholics became American. And the Ursulines were part of kind of a double-edged sword. On one hand, as Jefferson and many others later acknowledge, you really hold up civic values of the nation. Your, the charitable objects of your institution are exemplary. The other side of it was you're not fully American. You are um, uh, denizens of a church that pledges fealty to a pope, to a foreign despot. You're not democratic. You can't possibly be democratic because your religious culture is monarchical and absolutist. But you're not American at all. And the Ursulines got both of these reactions over the course of their history, and not them alone. Nonetheless, the Order of St. Ursula served not only as a model for other communities of nuns arriving on American shores, but sometimes as their agents. As in March 1836, when the New Orleans Ursulines received six young sisters of St. Joseph from France, dress them in disguise in order to facilitate their movement through the streets of New Orleans, and helped arrange for their passage on a steamer to St. Louis, where they opened a school for deaf children. Such inauspicious beginnings, a dozen sisters arriving here, half a dozen there, moving out kind of tentatively into the hinterlands or into the urban areas, these inauspicious beginnings were typical of the initial foundings of many religious community of women in the United States. As historian Carol Colburn notes, quote, most began with a small band of women, European, Canadian, or American born, who began living and working together in spiritual, emotional, and physical and economic support networks that eventually spanned every region of the country, close quote. Following the arrival of the Ursulines in New Orleans in 1727, 
The number of Catholic sisters in the United States grew to 46,000 by 1900, and then jumped to 90,000 by 1920. They represented over 300 separate religious communities working in American health care, education, and social service institutions like orphanages. What can we say then in our limited time this evening about the distinctive footprint made by these religious women? The example and experiences of the Ursulines, I believe, serve as a window on and even a microcosm of three major areas in which Catholic women religious shape the character of American Catholicism as well as the American nation. I'll consider these three areas together because they're really structurally interrelated and independent. They're different uh, facets of the same crystal, so to speak. First, women religion in this country have been institutional pioneers in the three sectors of their greatest impact, namely education, healthcare, and social services. Pioneers is a neutral word, as I could conjure. Their friends would say, not only pioneers, but spirit-inspired, adaptive, cutting-edge apostles of Jesus Christ, while their detractors might say, troublemaking, authority-shaking, <laughs> risk-taking, mavericks, with too much room to maneuver around bishops and male religious order. The truth, the truth is, whatever you call them, sisters, nuns, women religious, and there's all kinds of layers of meaning in all three, and they're used in different ways at different historical periods, Whatever you call them, and whether they come from left of center or right of the Vatican, American women vowed to religious communities have taken full and creative advantage of their hybrid and sometimes ambiguous ecclesial status. You know, the, the sisters are literally in no man's land, the space where neither the clergy or the laity reside. Strictly speaking, they're, they're laity, I mean, religious are laity, but we all who are real laity know they're not laity. <laughs> and they're certainly not clergy. And uh, this is an interesting space that they've inhabited historically. And in inhabiting it, they've taken advantage of that, more often than not, in order to create and sustain flexible, highly adaptive, and generally efficient structures of internal governance. Not only the Ursulines, but perhaps a majority of those 300 separate religious communities of women, including the Sisters of St. Joseph, the Benedictines, the Mary Noel Sisters, the Sisters of Mercy, the Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul, the Dominican Sisters of Amityville, New York, just to mention a handful of the communities currently being visited by the Vatican in the latest surely futile attempt at opposing some semblance of uniformity upon them, those communities have been able to work creatively within Vatican-approved rules and regulations in proposing and especially in interpreting and practicing their respective missions and their vows. And they have set the tone for their identity or their sense of self, their sense of vocation. Where and how do we live? How do we relate to laity and clergy? What is our distinctive charism or mission or gift of the Spirit? And how shall it be handed on? Whereas the Pope is the Vicar of Christ, and the abbot of the monastery ensconced in the place of God the Father for his monks, the Mother Superior, in representing God's Mother, outranks them both, <laughs> and has often acted accordingly in pursuing the goals of her order or congregation. A moment of silent respect, please, for those poor helpless bishops, those needy pastors whom the sisters had right where they wanted them, in a position of dependence. That is, if these pastors and bishops wanted their schools and hospitals and orphanages staffed, they had to deal with the sisters. This flexibility, creativity, and let's be honest, orneriness, has produced remarkable benefits. We shall begin close to home with Ursulines of New York State. Schleifer's account of the origins of this college is instructive. To improve the preparation of teachers for public and parochial schools in New York City, the Ursulines of St. Teresa's added a normal school department to their Henry Street Academy in 1883. The successful program drew the attention of New York City educators. The sisters have something here. And the academy became the first Catholic high school accredited for teacher training by the city's Board of Education. Within a few years, this creative enterprise 
came under the directorship of Mother Irene Gill, who talked about at dinner tonight. Born in Ireland in 1856, Irene had immigrated at age 12 to the United States. I think her name was Lucy, right? Had immigrated at age 12 to the United States in 1876, entered the novitiate. By the 1880s, she was already recognized for her leadership skills, her commitment to the education of women, and her vision of educational innovations required to meet rapidly changing circumstances in America. Some of those who knew her best, Dr. Schleifer recounts, remembered that, quote, she was slight in figure and in matter most modest and even retiring, with all her charming gentleness and suavity, which helped to make her pathway easier, one got the impression that she had an underlying strength of will of a kind necessary to the furtherance or completion of great designs. That's called Victorian prose, where she was a steely-minded, strong-spined woman. <laughs> Another account describes her as a complex woman of strong personality, thoroughly conventional in matters of morality, discipline, and proper social behavior, but visionary in the matter of women's education, which was her passion. This description of Mother Irene Gill is so typical of so many Mother Superior at the time that it could have been taken from a how-to manual. In 1896, the story continues, partly in response to shifting immigrant populations, the Ursulines moved their academy uptown to 93rd Street and Park Avenue, and Mother Irene traveled to New Rochelle to explore the possibility of establishing a seminary here for young women. She spoke with the pastor of Blessed Sacrament Church about her plans and learned from him that a wonderful potential site, Leland Castle, was available for purchase. In 1897, the Ursulines moved into their new home on Castle Place, where 10 boarders and 60 day students soon enter the Ursuline Seminary for Girls, what is now the Ursuline School on North Avenue, for many years an intrinsic part of the college with facilities in or near the castle. Here, Schlieffer's narrative takes a dramatic turn. I'm quoting from him. This is on your website, by the way. I'm sure you all know that. <laughs> but this is from his account. These endeavors in women's education over more than two decades would soon culminate in an even more audacious project. Mother Irene Gill had become persuaded that Catholic young women in New York needed the opportunity for a collegiate education. She had set her mind and will to the great design of the first Catholic college for women in New York State. Her college first needed a charter, but various obstacles threatened to intervene. Beyond the newness of such a venture and the complete lack of any funds, <laughs> minor thing, <laughs> friends, friends of Mother Irene's vision faced the skepticism of some clerics who spoke of Irene's folly. The coolness of at least one member of the New York State Board of Regents. The absence of any clear support from John Farley, Archbishop of New York, and the conflicting ambitions of other nearby Catholic academies for young women. I must pause here and say what was true for the Ursulines was true many times over for other women religious elsewhere in the country who had to overcome all these kinds of objections including no money and nonetheless founded these schools and hospitals and orphanages and so forth. Uh, this is a quote, uh, a direct quote, there is no doubt that there is a jealous rivalry existing between your institution and other Catholic institutions for women and while they cannot qualify as well as you can uh, can still they dislike very much to have any greater honors conferred on your institution. We must not get mixed up in any rivalry this kind. William H. Buckley of Albany was the author of these remarks and one of the ten men listed on the first board of trustees in the Charter of 1904. He played a crucial role in advising Mother Irene during these first stages. The little commentary here is, yes, women religious took initiative, but they didn't do it alone. What they did do is find out, find and identify partners in the community and in the church, men who uh, they needed to help push things through, as in this case. Um, I shall do everything in my power, Buckley assured Mother Irene, to promote the welfare of your institution, which I have no doubt will be proved to be one that will go down in history as the most prominent Catholic college for women in this country. That's all a quote from uh, Schlieffer. <coughs> The rest, as they say, is history. The Board of Regents granted the, granted the charter, and Mother Irene's design was launched. 
This pioneering independent spirit of the American nuns pervades the history of Catholic health care as well. Unlikely Entrepreneurs is the title of the historian Barbara Wall's study of the religious orders of women who founded and staffed Catholic hospitals in the second half of the 19th century. Wall argues that the woman-centered entrepreneurship displayed by Catholic nuns was made possible in large part by internal government structures and relative independence from Episcopal regulations that enabled them to create hospitals that had more in common with modern hospitals with fee-paying patients than with the traditional voluntary hospital of the 19th century. In a similar vein, Wall also traces the influence of religious nursing congregations in shaping social policies of the 20th century. The sisters' first-hand experience of the often agonized, now we're moving later into the 20th century, mid-20th century, that this refers to. During this period, there are long experience by this point in healthcare, which began in the Civil War period. So by a hundred years or so later, a little less than that, the sisters' long experience of the often agonizing moral, economic, institutional choices and dilemmas inherent in providing sophisticated health care, regulated increasingly by the state, made them, made the sisters, not the bishops or the clergy, the Catholic experts in this all-important sector of Catholic ministry. Especially after World War II, the sisters experienced at first hand what Wall calls, quote, the creeping standardization and secularization, close quote, of Catholic hospitals that accompanied the thinning of the Catholic presence and the greater and greater bureaucratization of the healthcare industry in this country, a trend that's been building now for decades, but really has reached a higher low point, depending on how you look at it, in the last decade. What a difference it made to the Catholic identity of these institutions that sisters were the ones mediating the religious and non-religious presences and authorities. And I think that was very much a positive difference, of course. Similarly, it is well known, it is well known at least among historians of uh, Catholicism in the United States, that it was nuns more than priests or laity who internalized the liberalizing religious and ethical tendencies associated with Catholicism's Second Vatican Council in the 1960s. Sisters, it could be argued, and I have argued it elsewhere, assimilated secular professional standards and identities more fully and rapidly than did other Catholic professionals. Not only secular standards, and I'm sure I'll say this in, in prose here, but what was striking, I did a study of priests uh, some years ago, priests who had been ordained from about 1945, 1950 to 1980, and who had lived through the Second Vatican Council, which for those of you who may not be familiar with it, we can talk later after the presentation with Q&A or discussion, was of course a tumultuous revolution, and it was an intense crisis for everyone in religious life, for priests, for bishops, for women religious. But I was struck in, in interviewing 75 priests across the country who had lived through Vatican II, how many of them said, that they got through it through the agency of the sisters in their parishes. Because the sisters got it earlier. The sisters, for complicated reasons, some of which was the way they were governed, the way they were able to work through items, the fact that they were fairly independent of the way things were done in the institutional church, male-dominated institutional church. The sisters were able to kind of read about, talk about, learn about Vatican II, and they had people like Sister Alice and Mary Luke Tobin and many, many others, Joan Chittister, Rosemary Ruther, etc., who were trans who were on the cutting edge translating it, and there were there were relatively fewer prohibitions or censorship. And it wasn't so much that the official church, pardon me, I don't mean to say the sisters aren't part, but they're not. But you know, <laughs> of the official church, it wasn't I I, I don't think it was uh, an intentional policy of keeping the priests from understanding the council. It was that it's such a massive organization and the Second Vatican Council filtered down to the priest, the clergy, and to the male religious even, but especially the priests and clergy who were the basic people in the trenches implementing the council, filtered just randomly almost and slowly. And uh, the priests would, would stand up at the pulpit um, because they would get these directives from Rome that they didn't quite understand. And one young priest told me 
the story that when he was the, the curate, the assistant pastor, his older, uh, this is 1968, uh, roughly, when the Novus Ordo, the new mass, was implemented, he was told by his pastor, uh, or his pastor was kind of an older, more traditional, a little bit the implication was a little curmudgeonly, and he was on vacation when the uh, document came from Chancery ordering the parish to move the altar from here, you know, where the priest was facing, and move it to a table setting, like as if it were a table. And, the, you know, this is a young hippie priest in the 60s, and the pastor's gone, so he does what the chancery says. And the pastor comes back and says, what the heck are you doing? I knew you were screwy. Put the altar back. What are you doing? Because I'm away. So the next week, the altar was here. The chancery got wind of it, sent another directive, and said, put it back. So in three consecutive weeks, the altar was in two different locations. Because they just didn't know exactly what the rationale they would say, we were told to preach. You are now the people of God. You are no longer um, simply docile children that the priests are telling you what to do. Why are you the people of God? Because we say so. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you many other stories about that. But the overall point is that the clergy, not for a fault of their own necessarily, but a complicated, again, complicated reasons, it took them a while to get Vatican II. And there was a lot of bitterness because they, they, there was not a lot of attention given to the, relatively little attention given to the priesthood in the documents, a lot to the laity, a lot to kind of updating uh, the apostolic life in a way. And the sisters, by and large, in this country, really were way out ahead. So those priests told me, you know, the reason I'm not bitter is because Sister So-and-so kind of sat with me and took, talked me through it and prayed me through it. Now, that wasn't the experience of everyone. But it was, it was striking how often that seemed to have happened. So these processes of it kind of absorbing the 60s, if you will, the 1960s, which is a story into itself that we can talk a little bit more about, but these processes changed the sisterhood, changed Catholic hospitals, changed the relation of the laity to both institutions, and ultimately changed the sense of vocation and mission. I'll say more about that later. This might be a case of ironic or unintended consequences. That is, the relative independence and autonomy of women and religious led to consequences they didn't anticipate. That's how history works. Well-intentioned, but unintended consequences, which I'll say something about in a moment. So the first area where women and religious really made their mark in American history and American Catholic history was in this flexibility, this relative autonomy, independence. Again, I don't want to overstate it, but because they were always in relationship to the bishop, to the priest, and so on, but they had much more autonomy than the priest would have, for example. A second and related area in which women religious exercised profound impact was in the realm of gender relations within church and society. Put simply, the Catholic sisterhood provided a sphere of women's agency and liberation, I use the square quotes, square, scare quotes there, because um, that's a charged term, but sisterhood provided a sphere of women's agency and liberation that gave secular and Protestant forms of feminism a run for their money. The late 19th and early 20th centuries was a time of extremely rapid, like our own, rapid social, cultural, and economic change in the United States, marked by new technologies, intense ur industrialization and urbanization, the concentration of economic power more powerfully in the hands of a, a, an elite, new cultural and educational institutions, and the struggle to transform the place and broaden the possibilities presented to American women. Historians of gender in this country describe this period at the end of the 19th, early 20th century as the period of the age of the new woman. The new woman. That is a period characterized by the expansion of professional opportunities, political rights, and educational options for women that they had not experienced before. In her recent book, New Women of the Old Faith, Gender in American Catholicism in the Progressive Era, my friend and colleague, historian Kathleen Cummings, examines the lives and careers of religious sisters such as Sister Julia McGrorty, SND, who was an American provincial superior of the School Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur, and founder of Trinity College for Catholic Women, Sister Sissian McElroy, SSJ, Sister of St. Joseph, who was a nationally influenced, uh, influential educator in Philadelphia, and also Kathy 
brings their stories together with the stories of pioneering Catholic laywomen, such as writers and journalists Margaret Buchanan Sullivan and Catherine Conway. These women who lived at the turn of the 20th century. Such women, the lay and the, the women religious, despite their different identities and roles within the church and, so and society, shared not only the conviction, they, they agreed that they were far more marginalized as Catholics in America than they were as women. That's one of Kathy's major themes, that these women religious and lay women who were very active in the progressive era said, you know, we get discriminated on both sides. We're women, we get it there. We're Catholics, we get it there. We really feel it as Catholics. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, the tougher, harder discrimination as Catholics. Cummings argues uh, they were far more marginalized as Catholics than as women, Cummings argues, but also that they shared, these women, a fundamental orientation and approach to the issues that were facing Catholic women in the Gilded and Progressive eras. That orientation I would call, I don't Kathy does use this term, that orientation would be called anti-feminist progressivism. These women were progressives, but they weren't feminists in the way we understand the term. That is, while these nuns and lay women shared with Protestants a firm commitment to many of the liberal causes associated with the social questions facing Americans in the progressive era, including the reform and extension of education, social policies aimed at mitigating the plight of the poor, the underemployed, and the working class. These Catholic women, they shared those goals, but unlike their Protestant counterparts, they tended to eschew attention. They didn't want to stand in the spotlight. They weren't public social reformers in the American public sphere, and they argued that they were already emancipated as Catholic women. Imagine that and rejected organizing with Protestant women in these feminist causes, right? This is very interesting. That, and, and by the way, uh, in my introduction uh, at some point, I've done some studies of comparative religions, and one of the interesting phenomena in the 20th century is it's not just Catholic women, but it's Jewish and Muslim and others who return to orthodoxy is the broader term, or who the feminists don't know how to handle these folks, the, the certain kinds of feminists, because they seem to be freely choosing a system that's patriarchal. That's, that's a puzzle. Why? And uh, again, that's a complicated question, and there, there, are, there are arguments on both sides, but the historian doesn't want to impose a 21st century mentality on women of the 1890s or 1920s. And so to say, why didn't you expect them to be like Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, uh, is inappropriate, but these new scholars of American women are explaining, you know, why, giving the justification, understanding the worldview of these Catholic women in a very interesting way now. Cummings' findings echoes much of recent scholarship about Catholic sisters in the late 19th, early 20th century. They exerted considerable power and agency within the confines of traditional gender roles. This was a place where if you wanted to have responsibility as an American woman and a Catholic, entering religious life was a pretty good choice. This was one of the places where you had authority and power. They pushed against the confines of gender, but also recognized that the early Protestant and secular feminist movement, owing largely to its fundamental secularism, was significantly flawed. Quote, American sisters were some of the best educated and most publicly active women of their time, notes Carol K. Coburn and Martha Smith in their influential work, Spirited Lives. Talented and ambitious women from working class and middle class backgrounds, regardless of ethnicity, advanced to teaching, nursing, administration, and other leadership positions in Catholic religious communities. The reverend mothers or superior generals of these religious congregations functions as some of the first female CEOs administering institutions, personnel, and financial resources throughout the country. That's a close quote from Carol Coburn and Martha Smith. So that's the end of that quote. Yet, owing to the powerful and pervasive stereotype of nuns as passive, otherworldly creatures, naive and unassuming, of course, anyone who actually knew the nuns would never have said this or who taught 
or were students in their schools, you wouldn't think of them as passive or otherworldly, in a way, perhaps otherworldly, but not naive, not unassuming. But the, the stereotype was they're sheltered from the secular world. Uh, it often escapes notice from historians and other analysts outside looking in that these women religious had freedoms unknown to most other women until well into the 20th century. Catholic sisterhoods also helped to create public space for women that was not previously available to them. They did so by trailblazing careers in charitable endeavors, hospitals, schools, and social institutions. So that's the second mark, the gender relations, the way that these Catholic sisters and some Catholic lay women negotiated their gender roles within a society and a church that was male-led, male-dominated, patriarchal, but how creatively they dealt with that situation. A third and final mark of influence, at least that I'm going to mention tonight, is the sisters' major and sometimes overlooked role in the Americanization of the Catholic immigrant population. Certainly, the, the widely recognized vehicle for this decades-long project was the Catholic parochial school system, as well as catechetical instruction for Catholic students who attended public schools. The majority of Catholic students attended public schools, not parochial schools. And those schools, uh, the parochial schools and the CCD and the other kind of catechetical programs, were an important vehicle for turning immigrant Italians and Irish and Polish into Americans. You pledged the allegiance and in those schools. You went almost overboard to demonstrate that Catholics could be good Americans. And the sisters were often the ones making sure that you got it. They were the front lines of education, and more importantly than education, which we sometimes, by that we mean, you know, you learn to read, write, arithmetic, they were the masters of formation. That's much more important in a way. That is, they were forming souls, they were forming character, they were forming worldviews of young Catholic boys, girls, young men and women, and they were forming them in a way that integrated a profound and traditional faith, in the best sense of that term traditional, with a patriotic Americanism. That's well known. This was largely in the hands of Catholic nuns. Colleges like New Rochelle and St. Xavier's Chicago, the Sisters of Mercy Institution, where I taught early in my career, these institutions educated and trained Catholic women and eventually men in the concepts, procedures, and standards of American professional life, from nursing to education to today, computer science and software. St. Xavier's, which is still a Sisters of Mercy place, the number of sisters are diminished, but they uh, have always educated nurses and teachers on, in southwest Chicago for generations. Now they're teaching in African American, it used to be Irish, white, Irish, middle class, working class students. Now, which seems to be, from what I can tell, the trajectory of New Rochelle, similarly, now what the sisters are doing in Chicago, and I presume here, is welcoming Latino, African American, a more racially and culturally diverse group, but they're still, you know, the charism that is the orientation is still to prepare these folks for fruitful professional lives and also a sense of character, a sense of virtue. It's, it's trickier when, as has happened over time, the students are not all Catholics. Some are Muslim, some come from no religious background, some come from a variety of backgrounds. But there has been a remarkable continuity in the way that the sisters um, have approached this notion of forming, forming souls, forming character in faith and in civic virtue at the same time. Even though the faith itself might not be, in every case, Roman Catholicism as such. Um, they do, they've done so, of course, by educating the whole person, by inculcating an integral humanism. That phrase is sometimes associated with the Jesuits. But it really is much broader than the Jesuits, and they haven't spoiled it. <laughs> I was educated by the Jesuits, so I can make fun. The traditional vows of, of that the, many of the sisters took, especially in the 19th and the 20th century, the traditional vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience served and continue to serve the apostolic goal of modeling a life devoted singularly to Christ, but this, these vows also perform important social functions, fostering a, na a natural solidarity between the sisters and the poor and the working class. That is, the sisters themselves often came from the similar background as the people they were educating or ministering to in the hospitals. Um, and also, as I've said, indicate they had a certain space for freedom, 
and they also were available to, um, to be in solidarity with young women, particularly. Not only young women, but the fact that they were, in a sense, professional women, certainly women of vocation, who had given their lives in the service for others, this proved to be a very powerful example. This was one form of Americanizing Catholic style. Not merely in the sense of combining pro-liberal, these women were progressives, and anti-liberal, they were conservative anti-feminist, but by shifting the terms of the question. These religious women forced everyone to ask, how are both of these sets of sensibilities and orientations to the American liberal project, seemingly at war with one another, cultivated and maintained within the same individual Catholic? That is, how can they be so traditional on one hand, living, uh, if not a cloistered life in, in most cases that I'm talking about, still living a life of simplicity, humility, celibacy, poverty. That's so outre, right? You know, the deep beginning of the 20th century is countercultural. At the same time, it wasn't as if they were from a benighted age. These sisters were educated, they were progressive in the best sense of that term. That is, they were very much involved with social issues of the day, and they taught that social commitment. So it's, it's a transcending the kind of pro and anti-American into a very interesting uh, unity of identity, in which you see that the life of, of Christ, the life of the apostles, is both personally humble and simple and dedicated, and that in no way restricts or weakens its public relevance. In fact, the contrary is the case in the best examples of the women religious. They saw women clearly devoted to the faith, to this increasingly countercultural, and what? You believe what? And yet, these women were deeply devoted, and they were not cloistered in the intellectual sense. You know, that is, separate from the relevant issues of the world. So, understanding how generations of Catholic sisters were able to embrace democratic and liberal values in principle, and identify these principles as thoroughly Catholic, while simultaneously rejecting the form and part of the content of mainstream American social movements of the day, which they judged to be virulently anti-Catholic, or today anti-religious, how they did this opens a window on the tensions of our debates within the church and society today. The clashes within the American Catholic community and within the larger nation. The sisters found a way to combine these things in the kind of unity that's instructive for the rest of us. You'll be happy to know I'm coming to my third and concluding section. Today, Roman Catholicism in the United States finds itself in full-scale crisis. While there are many candidates for leading indicator of Catholic institutional decline, including the loss of one of every three baptized Euro-American Catholics to another faith or to no faith at all, the largest religious body in the United States remains Roman Catholics. The second remains lapsed Catholics, non-practicing baptized Catholics. The third is American Baptist. Perhaps none of these indi indicators of institutional decline in the American church, none is more potentially decisive than the staggeringly sharp and rapid decline in the number of active women religious over the past 50 years and the precipitous drop in the number of new vocations. I used to know the statistics exactly. There's something like this. In 1960, there were 180,000 women religious in this country. Today, there are about 70,000. So they've been cut in half in 50 years, and in the next five to 10 years, it's gonna be cut in half again. And there's no demographic trend that looks like it's gonna potentially reverse that. So there's been a pre precipitous drop in the number of new vocations over many years. There's a little blip here and there in some of the more conservative traditional religious orders, but statistically, I must say, insignificant in terms of the fact that in 1960, you had 160,000 essentially unpaid laborers who had built the church in this country, and they are leaving. They're going to their reward is, is the primary uh, cause. Some have left religious life but most of the sisters are aging, and they're still active, but not in the same numbers. And this is the biggest crisis, I think, facing the church, of many crises. And my remarks have indicated, certainly no exaggeration to say that the Catholic Church in the United States 
was built and sustained for over a century, mid-19th to mid-20th, built and sustained for over a century, not only by priest and male religious, but arguably first and foremost by the religious women, who is essentially free labor, exquisite competence, and unsurpassed dedication to education, health care, and other works of mercy and social justice, made American Catholicism the largest private network of social service agencies serving the common good of this nation. It was the sisters, along with our mothers, who taught us the catechism, how to say our prayers, the difference between right and wrong, as much as, if not more than, any other sector of the Catholic world, they have been the bearers of tradition. Always outnumbered the priest. You know, when there were 160 women religious, there were 55,000 priests. Right? So three to one. They have been, the sisters have been the bearers of tradition. Who? What group? What network? What demographic? might replace them is not even remotely clear. Why is religious life in decline, especially among American women? I thought I'd make sure you stay awake and by ending with this. Why is religious life in decline, especially among American women? This is what sociologists call an overdetermined phenomenon. That is, there are so many powerful causative factors that no one or two can be singled out as the sufficient cause. The ambient culture, with its indiscriminate celebration of every expression of sexuality, save voluntary celibacy, which is not universally celebrated. <laughs> um, and uh, um, the fact that religious life is now held in esteem, in, some, in low esteem, is now held in low esteem in some quarters, reversing social trends that predominated in immigrant families as recent as the 1950s, another reason, not only the kind of sexual, uh, sexually permissive atmosphere, but also the really, uh, the, the diminished status of religious life, of commitment to religious life. My son, who is now uh, a tenor at the Metropolitan Opera, uh, when he was um, 11 years old, it was career day, that was he was born in 1983, the son I'm talking about, so that was 1994. It was, he was 11 years old, whatever grade that would have been, fourth grade, fifth grade, I don't know, sixth grade, help me out. But anyway, he was 11 years old, and it was career day. And he said, I said, what are you going to dress up? He was, they were supposed to dress up as the career they thought they would be. I said, Paul, what are you going to, what are you going to, uh, what are you going to dress up as? He said, well, I either want to be a major league shortstop or a priest. And I said, why not both? And he said, well, I think I'll dress up to be a priest. 1994. Came home that day, crestfallen. What's wrong? They mocked me. Are you gay? Are you perverted? Are you this and that? 1994 was really a, uh, an eye-opener for, for me. Um, the, the, the low esteem in which religious life, that's just one anecdote, but the lower esteem, whereas for most of the 20th century and the 19th century, quite the opposite was the case. Irish families, of course, designated a child to go into religious life, to get everyone else to heaven and to uh, mark of status. And someone at least who would make some money. They didn't make any money, but at least they had three square meals. Um, the point is that it was, it was up until relatively recently in my lifetime, which is not that long ago, that, that this was um, a prominent, and I would say late 80s, early 90s, the shift, a prominent uh, mark of respect and honor for a young woman or man to go into Catholic religious life. That's not the case now. So, sexual climate, low esteem of religious life, the reluctance of younger generations of America, Americans to enter into lifelong commitments of any kind, mm -hmm. the fallout from the, press, the priestly sexual abuse scandal, compounded with the, the continuing signs that Rome just doesn't get it, signs such as the recent Vatican pronouncement seeming to rank support for the ordination of women to the priesthood among sins as grave as pedophilia. And the expanded opportunity, and, and a very important, a very important factor is the expanded opportunities for women to exercise leadership and wield authority in many professions, diminishing the special quality of the sisterhood 
as a historic center of feminism Catholic style. All of these are among the many factors that have led to the decline in uh, religious life, the numbers of young women entering it, and many others. These are among the developments since the 1960s which have dimmed the glow of religious life for many, if certainly not all, American women. I have my own theory in addition to these, though it's not mine alone. In a nutshell, it is this. Success did the men. Allow me to explain. The generation of American religious women that came of age in the 1960s and 1970s was pivotal. I see those women not as betrayers of the traditions they inherited, but as faithful interpreters, as they'd always been, faithful interpreters who practice adaptation, creativity, innovation, loyalty, and also independence, relative, much as their forebears did in an earlier time under different conditions and different horizons of possibility. In other words, the sisters didn't certainly didn't suddenly start being creative and adaptive and independent and autonomous in 1962. They'd always been that. But the 1960s were different than the 1860s, than the 1880s, and the 1920s, all of which had their own challenges. Obedient, obedient these sisters of the 60s were, in the way that most communities of Catholic religion, of Catholic women, had always been. I don't mean to be smart out of here. In other words, not obedient at all. In other words, that's not what I'm saying. They were obedient. But they obeyed by internalizing the imperatives of the gospel, as well as the directions and commands of their male counterparts. Remember Sister St. Angela, take good advice and then go ahead and do what you need to do. So they, they had always followed the gospel, which is their great charism overall, to live a life of apostolic devotion to Christ and to Mary, to the saints, but, and also to take to defer when necessary and take the advice of their male uh, counterparts and superiors especially that advice that seemed to conform to the gospel. So they were obedient, certainly, in studying and emulating the principles and models of a Giornamento, of updating, promoted by the Second Vatican Council, as they'd always been. They took it seriously. Their various construles of the teaching of the Council were legitimate, even if internally and externally contested. Vatican II roiled all these communities inside and out. And many of the women, it must be said, outgrew the institutional church, which has remained divided in its interpretation of the legacy of American religious life and the meaning of the Second Vatican Council. When I say they outgrew the institutional church, I don't mean the entire institutional church, I mean certain aspects of it that didn't update. This is not to say the sisters are no, are no less, are less committed to institutional life than they were, that's not what I'm saying. But they were adapting ahead of the church, ahead of other sectors of the institutional church, especially when it came to the Second Vatican Council. Yes, it is true that the major sociological appeal of religious life for American Catholic women, namely the opportunity for the exercise of a level of responsibility and freedom denied to other women, and an alternative to the narrower career and social path determined for them in the world, that appeal has diminished greatly as American women began to experience greater and greater degrees of autonomy and liberation. But I believe a deeper cause of decline in traditional vocations, with the partial exception of the boldly countercultural orders that have sprung up in recent decades, is the realization on the part of that pivotal cohort of women religious that is now going to their reward that the old wineskins cannot hold the new wine that the logic of Vatican and other ecclesial rationales and imperatives is no longer compelling, and dare I say it, not always sufficiently in accord with what the sisters internalize as the gospel of Jesus Christ. Recently I was asked by the Sisters of Mercy in the Chicago area to explain to them why, after all the decades of genuinely selfless service to the poor, the ignorant, the marginalized, and the oppressed, service undertaken in the name of Holy Mother Church, why was the Vatican investigating them? I would have been uh, uh, irresponsible to say because the Vatican finds new ways to shoot itself in the foot every, every day. That was not the answer I gave. But they want to know, why are they investigating us? Lord, we can find a lot of other people to investigate. Why us? The average age of the 120 sisters in attendance at the session, I estimated, was 78 with many much older in wheelchairs or walkers. 
asking poignantly, why are they, why are they sending people to visit us? Because there's a certain tone of disapproval in the visit. Prior to my session, these sisters had been praying to the sounds and sights of a video presentation of the work of Catholic sisters around the world, many of them working in solidarity with Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist women and men to help relieve the ills of poverty, HIV, AIDS, natural disasters, and war. I asked, how many of you believe that God is at work and inspiring these women, whatever their doctrinal beliefs or religious practices, creed, affiliation? How many of you believe that there is no male or female in Christ, but only one Lord, one church, one apostle for all? How many of you are committed to empowering young women as well as men to take real effective leadership in Catholic parishes, dioceses, new religious movements, and interfaith organizations? To these and several other such questions, I asked, the vast majority of his sisters indicated their agreement. We believe God is working in those Buddhists and Hindu and Muslims. We believe that um, there is no male or female in Christ. We believe that we must empower young women as well as men to serve and take leadership positions in parishes today. When they all raised their hands to these questions, I then asked, so now do you know why they are investigating? <laughs> <laughs> these women seem to these women seem to these women seemed to me, well before I tendered my makeshift exam, to be transparently holy, many of them. Servants of the servants of God, successors of the apostles, Christian disciples. In a word, they had succeeded in their vocations in their personal and communal journey, not just a personal isolated journey, but a communal journey of self-transformation in Christ through service to the neighbor in need. So they succeeded. However, the structures, social, ecclesial, and cultural, that had made it plausible then for them to do so as uncloistered, active contemplatives vowed to religious life and community, those structures have virtually disappeared from the landscape. For today's liberated but not quite transformed young American Catholic women, the compelling logic for the sisters' kind of religious life has ebbed with the erosion of these structures, the cultural, social, and ecclesial structures, which made it at least tolerable and bearable and sometimes liberating to work within this broader institutional church. So, let us praise the Order of St. Ursula and the 300 women religious communities established in this country in the aftermath of their arrival, and pray that in ways that demographers as well as the historians cannot begin to imagine, God's renewing spirit will summon forth their successors in whatever organizational configuration and personal incarnation. But we cannot imagine a vital American Catholicism in their absence. Happy anniversary. <laughs> What can the United States do? Yeah. Um, can you say a little bit more? Uh, I understand the question. It's, it, it, give me a little sense of exactly what you're talking about, because it can be applied in a lot of different ways. You mean religion around the world? Yes. Like religion here? No, religion around, in the U.S., religion in the U.S. Okay. Um, I, this is how I'm going to interpret the question, and, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. The question is, what, what can be done? Let me put it that way. What can be yeah. done? Because I'm not sure the United States... Uh, the government or the state can do anything. But the question is, what about the instrumentalization of religion? Or religion, excuse me. That is, what, the, the fact that we've been witnessing, it's always been the case, by the way, in American history, that religion has been applied and used for political and social purposes. That's not new. But um, what is new is the kind of uh, deepened ideological divisions, the use of technology, 
the use of um, modern organizing political, the, the real conflation of religious and political uh, goals. Um, if it's not entirely new, it's certainly more intense and rapid and pervasive than it has been. What can be done about it? It's a complicated, it's a good question, it's complicated because um, in two ways. Number one, I wouldn't want to say that um, network, am I remembering that right? The, the coalition of lobbyists who are Catholic sisters and others, who is a lobbying group in Washington that is, uh, that lobbies on behalf of the poor, the hungry, you know, is that the instrumentalization of religion? Is that using religion as an instrument? I wouldn't want to say that. I would say that's an expression of a deep Christian faith that believes that it should have an impact in the world and that Christianity or any other religion, I suppose, worth its salt, is not only about cultivating interior piety or character or deep religious life, but that the seeds and the fruits of that have to be expressed in social justice or social... So if you, if you agree with me on that, which not everyone does, some people would say that was a mistake. Even no matter whose politics it is, it's still politics, and religion is not all about that. I don't share that view. I think religion is a seed, a light. It's Jesus uses those metaphors. It ought to transform the world. Jesus talks a lot more. doesn't say much about heaven, actually. He says a lot more about feeding the poor here. That's not a metaphor. Feeding the hungry, liberating the captives. There's every once in a while there's a reference here and there. My father's house has many mansions, but Jesus is talking about liberation in the here and now, which is not unrelated to, and in fact, is the firmest expression, fullest expression of one's spiritual relationship to the Father. So I could argue that I think you have to have a social, a social expression of your faith if you interpret Jesus that way as a Christian. Now the question becomes, what does politics mean, and instrumentalization mean? Because I, I don't deny that what you're getting at is a problem. And, and it may be a matter of degrees, I think it's something different, that is between, um, between people who are living out their faith, faith and they want to side with the poor, the oppressed, um, some, some Christians believe that they have a preferential option for Wall Street, so it, de it, it, it depends on what your interpretation is. But generally speaking, the poor, the oppressed, uh, the hungry, and there are plenty of people in this country uh, and around there are 43 million poor people in this country. A million people, a million children every year are hungry in this country, are malnourished. One million, 43 million poor. So you don't have to go outside the borders. So, that's, that seems to me to be a legitimate expression, whether it's from a conservative or a progressive. You've got to express your religious faith in the public order, in the public realm. So when does it become instrumentalizing in a negative sense? And that would be worth a, a longer conversation than I can, should give and probably could give. But I think when we begin to talk about um, programs and policies and politics, that are more about advancing a particular political party or agenda, that are, that are exclusivist, that are about um, uh, the politics of resentment. In other words, there, there are ways in which the content and the inspiration and the, the, the tone and spirit of some of these efforts not only reflect, um, not only prompt one to say, let me ask critically, is that really a spirit of faith that's imbuing your movement politically, it, uh, we can challenge that on religious grounds. The government can't do that, I don't think. But other Christians can say, I don't object to you uh, being out there lobbying for your cause. I don't object to you supporting a candidate. Maybe what I object to is the take no prisoners, slash and burn, dehumanizing, demeaning, divisiveness that sometimes accompanies those overzealous approaches. That's a little bit too impressionistic than I, is too impressionistic, but somewhere along that line, so the, the only thing I'm saying is, the question is, how do you, the fo to focus your questions on doing, how do you see where the, how do you define when the boundary is crossed between the legitimate expression of one's faith in the public order and the betrayal of that faith and its spirit 
through taking on secular or other kinds of political tactics that really um, violate other canons of the, of the religion, other parts of the religion. Every person has human dignity. I don't, I don't know what you folks think about President Obama, but I've never seen, I had to laugh out loud when he said, uh, Labor Day, or at some point he said, they treat me like a dog. And I had to laugh because he was unscripted. I don't know if you saw He said, these people treat me like a dog. And I thought, man, oh man. I've never, I've seen some bad stuff in this country. But what they've done to that man, I think is completely unforgivable. And, and I would take some of the people Rush Limbaugh, if I were president, I'd try him and hang him for treason. <laughs> just to let you know where I stay. <laughs> and the Glenn Max. I mean, just because, especially those who say this is Christian or this is that, the other thing. All right. So you got a lot of pontificating from me on that. Sorry, it wasn't a better, better answer. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know you answered this in your speech, but if you can elaborate just a little bit, um, can you identify creative ways the Earth Science used in order to overcome nativism? and feminize higher education. What was the very first, can I comment about how they did that? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, because I did say, I didn't, I wasn't particularly clear about the feminizing higher education, but I'll come back to it. How they overcame nativism, the, the reference there was, um, that's why I quoted Jefferson, as his attempt to get that point across, at least in an initial way, that um, on one hand, the sisters, to, to give a fuller answer to this, the sisters inflamed the situation in certain ways. Not, not intentionally, provocatively, but you have you ever seen a wimple? Right? You know, the sisters would dress, I mean, Lady Gaga never outdid them in terms of, you know, a kind of provocative, I'm not you kind of uh, couture, right? That, that, and I'm quite serious. That the sisters were odd. They were alien. They were other. They dressed, and so were priests. But sisters were really out there. In terms of, of, terms of their dress, their customs, they lived in, in, you know, if not in cloister, they lived in cup. And so this is not to blame the sisters. It's to say that they, when I say on one hand, they were magnets, if you will. They were provocative, not intentionally. But if your fear was in 1850, 1870, 1920, that Catholics, first of all, were coming over here in waves and waves and waves, taking our jobs, very much similar to the immigrant situation today in Arizona and elsewhere. They're, they're violent. They uh, break laws. They're not here legally. And worse, they live in these convents. The best-selling book, one of the best-selling books from 1844, I'm getting the name wrong, well into the late 19th century was the awful disclosures of the Hotel du Nunnery by Mariah Monk. Do you know that? Do you know about that? This was a book supposedly written by a, 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 a woman who had been in a convent in, um, in Montreal, Quebec, Montreal, supposedly in, that, in a convent, and she wrote this, um, uh, today it would be called a blog, <laughs> no, today it would be called a tabloid, she wrote this book claiming that all kinds of terrible things were going on in those convents. Priests were impregnating nuns and they were killing the babies, uh, that they, that the illegitimate children, all kinds of scurrilous things. Now, this was made up, and it turned out that uh, Rebecca Reed, the woman who wrote this book, was emotionally troubled. And that was widely reported. Didn't stop the book from being sold. Time, it really, it, and that's just, that's one prominent example of a nativism, meaning that native-born white American Protestants were being threatened because the Irish were taking their jobs, or the, or the Lithuanians, or eventually the Italians, the Lithuanians, Poles, taking their job, and, and that this, the, the aunt, Lyman Beecher, who I mentioned, was a Protestant preacher who said, These people, we're American, Protestant, Democrats, those things go together. The Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, was about standing up to an autocratic, monarchical pope who would never know a human right if it hit him in the face, and who has all these women running around in these, these get-ups, you know, subservient to them, and men, and their male religious, you know, uh, priests, and they're really anti-democratic, and they're coming over here in waves, and they're here to overthrow this country. That was a very real and deep and abiding fear. There was a rumor that the Jesuits 
were going to take over, have a revolution in the Mississippi Valley in the, in the, after the Civil War. I mean, this was rampant. And there were waves. It starts in 1840s with the burning of the Ursuline Convent and with the waves of John uh, Hughes in New York and the debate over public education for Catholics and private education. There were episodes of nativism. Uh, there was a party called the American Party, and that, that or probably known as the Know Nothings, mm -hmm. who were very powerful in the middle of the 19th century for about 12 years, won a lot of elections on anti Catholic platforms. And there was an organization called the American Protective Association, headquarters Clinton, Iowa, in the 1880s, that took a vow we will not employ, we will not hire Catholics, among other things. And then the Ku Klux Klan in the early 20th century, which was uh, opposed not only to African Americans but to Catholics and Jews, mm -hmm. was again a native expression. So the point is, there was this long strain in American history of anti Catholic suspicion, persecution, hostility. There's a little bit of what you see in the New York Mosque or Prayer Center, right? They're not Americans. They're from a for they take foreign fatwas, like the Pope was issuing his own fatwas in the 19th century or encyclicals. They're not American. I started to say the sisters, the nuns, were like put bullseyes on their chests. Instead, what they had is big bleeding sacred hearts of Jesus, which was almost as frightening. That is, they seem to be the exactly what the kind of thing that the, the Protestants were afraid of. These women who were asexual, uh, living together in community with these wimples, these, these they look like uh, who knows what. Um, much like veiled Muslim women today are rejected for their dress. So, on the one hand, the Catholic women, through no fault of their own, just living their own kind of stubbornly loyally to Catholicism, were, were living their lives as Americans, and there were many American Protestants and Catholics, so that's exactly their running. So there was a battle in the streets. There were many people killed during these episodes. There was a riot in New York of the Irish at a certain point in the 18...